welcome to another episode of Lost But Found. Today we'll be answering the question of does God need us to pray? We've got Pastor Alba here and I'm Brandon. So yeah, let, let's just get straight into it. So the first sub-question, I'll ask Albert. Not the major question. The major question is, does God need us to pray? Okay. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, so we'll, we've got some sub-questions which, we'll, uh, which we'll answer and hopefully that'll give the answer to the major question. I'll do my best anyway, yeah, yeah. So firstly, if God already knows our needs, what's the purpose of prayer? Okay. Um, I think we need to evaluate to begin with what prayer is um, because there are lots of differing ideas about um, what prayer is and um, prayer is just chatting like we're talking to one another now um, we could in a sense in a very broad sense say we're praying um, because prayer is conversation Prayer is communication. Prayer is engaging with another over something that you've got in your mind or in your heart. Okay, so it's important to clarify what prayer is. There's lots of religious ideas, lots of religious concepts that are attached to prayer, but prayer really is just having a conversation. Should prayer be formal, informal? How would you how would you pray? It depends on who you're talking to, really. Um, if you were at Buckingham Palace, where the king is, okay, and you'd be in a line there, and you'd be one after the other, praying in the sense of communication with the king, you would not be totally casual in the way that you're speaking to the king. One, because he is the king. Second, that there is a place of um, recognition of his kingship. And there is also a place where you're recognizing that you don't have a relationship with that king, and therefore there needs to be a degree of formality. Now, when we look at it from the Christian concept, and we look at it from the concept of being Christians, being children of God, being those who have been brought close to God as a father, even though he is a king and almighty, the difference in the way in which we talk is based upon informality and based on relationship. Because Christ has opened the door and that's what the, you know he talks about himself being the way, the truth, and the life. And I am the door. He is the door that has opened up, if you like, the very throne room of God Almighty himself. And God Almighty himself looks upon you, Brandon, and upon me, Albert, and he looks upon the whole of the Christian body of believers as his children. Yeah. And so as children, we go and chat, we converse, wrap it up in a technical, theological and religious term, we pray to the Father. And so, to answer your question, is there a particular way in which we should pray? You pray according to who you are and in accordance with your relationship with the Father. So if you come to Christ and you're a child of God, would you just? Uh, I'm, I'm just talking about from, yeah, from yeah. My, my from my point of view, like in terms of how I pray. I I pray to Jesus, and I just you know in a room by myself, I say hi Jesus, and I chat to him. Perfect. Perfect. Okay, so there doesn't have to be like a formality of <coughs> no official wording or no, absolutely not. I mean, there is <coughs> there's a guy I was speaking to just um, ten days ago. Now he rang me, um, going through some problems and difficulties, and. Um, uh, he rang me up one evening about 10 o'clock at night and um, you know he was beside himself and really stressed out really worried and I, I, I just listened to him and um, I shared some information with him shared some what I thought was wisdom with him and he carried on and he carried on and I shared the wisdom again with him and he carried on and he carried on in his stressful state <clears throat> and um, I was just saying to him, look, 
take it to Father. Because I just, in recent weeks, led him to Christ. And by leading somebody to Christ, I mean I'd shared with him the gospel, um, asked him whether he wanted to know Jesus as his saviour, and he gave his life to Christ. And he's on a, a, a difficult journey, very hard journey for him personally. But I just said to him, take it to Father. And to which he said, well, I, I've tried, but my mind is all over the place. And, you know, I don't know what to say. And, you know, I, I'm just stressed out. And I said, don't you think he knows that? Don't you, know, don't you think he can fathom out where you're talking nonsense and when you're talking sense? Do you think he can't work out between the swear words and the ordinary words, you know, what you're trying to actually communicate? Don't you think God in it is, is omniscience? meaning he knows all things. Um, don't you think he knows exactly what your heart is and your mind is and, and, and where you're coming from? Well, yeah, I suppose so, but it's hard. And I said, well, yeah. <coughs> you're chatting to me on the phone. You're telling me how you feel. We're just telling how you feel. Yeah. And he'll work out, don't you worry, he'll work out exactly what you're trying to say. And in the midst of where you are confused, He'll sort it out for you. I think that leads on to uh, another question to do with the first one. Um, so if, if God already knows what we need, mm -hmm. um, then why do we have to ask him? Okay. And I know that's that I, I you know, I know that comes across as quite arrogant. Um, <coughs> no, 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 it's not at all. The reason I'm asking is because I know a lot that is a lot what a lot of people think, which well if God already knows and he loves us, why doesn't he just okay. help us? Okay. Anyway? Let me <sighs> try and provide a little bit of um, an underpinning, a foundation, really, um, you know, to the topic that we've got, and does God need us to pray? Um, because without that foundation, um, without that underpinning, um, maybe some of the questions that I get asked, and maybe some of the questions that arise from my answers, um, won't have the relevance that they should have, or won't bring the understanding that they should. So, first of all, we've got to recognise God for who he is. Okay, so God is omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent. Now, they're three theological terms, um, and yet they're misunderstood by so many people. So, omnipotent means that he has all power. Omniscient means he knows everything, past, present, and future, and he is omnipresent, meaning he is everywhere at all times. So he is here with us. Those people who are watching this podcast, he's here with you right at this minute. You can't escape him wherever you are, he is, because he is omnipresent, okay? And yet, he desires us to pray. So why on earth when he has all power, he knows everything past, present and future, and he is everywhere at all times, why on earth does he want us to pray? Logically speaking, God doesn't need us. Logically speaking, he doesn't need us to pray. There isn't a need in God for you and for me. He desires but it isn't a driving need that he, outside of himself, is unable to do anything about it. You know, we have a need. Um, uh, we might be hungry, just as an example. We might be hungry or thirsty, okay? So we have subconsciously and consciously, we recognize that need, so we go to the sink and we take a drink. The need has driven us. Um, we're hungry, so we go to the lager, Lager. Yeah. Uh, maybe go for a lager in the fridge, yes, even that. But we go to the larder and we look in the larder and we examine the larder, we look all the way around it to see what is going to meet with our conscious need at that moment and we're driven by it, yeah? God isn't driven by any internal need to do anything. But he has desires anyway that are born out of love born out of um, compassion. And so God doesn't need us to pray for him to act. He isn't held back when we don't pray, yeah? 
Um, and he knows what we need before we even ask. You know, there is a verse of the Bible says that before I call, he has answered. Now the answer might not be what we want to hear. Um, it might be no when we want a yes, but you know, before we call, he will answer. Yet prayer is not about informing or reminding God of something he's forgotten, you know, or giving him instruction in something, you know, because, um, you know, he knows everything. It's about relationship. And that's the key to it, really. It's about relationship and participation. Relationship with him and participation in the outworking of his sovereignty in the world. And our praying and our call to pray, our call to engage in conversation with the Father, which we have because of Jesus, yeah, is an invitation into a privilege that only the children of God have. And I'll make that as a point here. Only the children of God have the invitation to pray to the Father. Everybody who is outside of the faith in Christ, they may speak and speak and speak and speak, but they'll never be heard because the dead never say anything. Mm. And we're dead in trespasses and sins outside of Christ. So as the children of God, we are invited to converse with God. We call it prayer. And it's our privilege and it is his delight for us to do so. So prayer is his way of intimacy with us. Prayer is his way of allowing us to co-labor with him in the outworking of his sovereign will in the world in which he's created. So I, I think it's important to lay that as a foundation <clears throat> because every question that comes out of our podcast today really has that as its foundation. Let me just say something else as well. You know, because I said that, um, you know, outside of Christ, nothing anybody says is ever going to get heard. Um, and, you know, in the Christian world, there is a misunderstanding of the term in Jesus' name. You know, nearly 99% of prayers that you hear Christians make at the end of it almost like the conclusion that follows every single prayer they make it says and Lord I say this in the name of Jesus now there's a misunderstanding about using that term in the name of Jesus while it's biblical John 14 John is a, one of the gospels in the bible and chapter 14 and verses 13 to 14 you know, declares to us that when we come to God the Father, we should pray in the name of Jesus. Fine, that's absolutely right. But it's not a magical phrase. You know, it's not like a magician standing there saying, Abracadabra, and he gets what he wants. It's not a, you know, Turkish delight, open sesame, you know, and the cave opens and you get all the treasures that are in there. It's not a, it's not a phrase that, puts the arm behind God and says, you'll give me what I've asked for because I've said in the name of Jesus. But a lot of Christians subconsciously, when they say in the name of Jesus, are actually portraying that. Mm. You see, <clears throat> when we say in Jesus' name, when we're praying, it means that we're praying in alignment with the will and character of Jesus. Um, it's saying that we are asking, we're conversing, we're chatting, knowing what the heart and mind of God is in that thing that we're speaking about. Asking for what he would ask for, i.e. Jesus, and seeking what he desires. You see, if I'm an ambassador and you're a king, and you've said, Albert, you're my ambassador to Tunbridge Wells. And I want you to go to Tunbridge Wells and I want you to tell Tunbridge Wells the following. Now, I could go to Tunbridge Wells knowing what you'd already told me, 
knowing what your heart is, knowing what your mind is, and I could declare as your ambassador and say, in the name of the king. Or even just turn on his head and ask something completely different. Correct. But I could then be coming into the town and I say those things, but then I add a whole load of other stuff. But how do I know that it is the heart and the mind of the king for me as the ambassador to declare? And you see, as Christians, we invariably say in the name of Jesus, but do we know his mind and do we know his heart when we are actually declaring that? Now, don't get me wrong. It is because of Jesus that we have access to the throne room of God. Yeah, so, you know, we come in the name of Jesus with his authority, with the underpinning foundation of what he has done in saving us and making us children of God. And so in the name of Jesus, we come into the throne room of God and we chat with God, we pray, yeah? But when we are praying, it's important that we know the heart and that we know the mind of Christ when we say, in the name of Jesus. Because I think, and I'm just using my imagination here, that maybe God says sometimes to us, and we perhaps don't hear it saying, why are you saying in the name of Jesus? What authority have you had at this moment to ask of me something in the name of my son? That doesn't, that doesn't coincide with his heart. That doesn't coincide with his mind. That doesn't coincide with the will of God, the Father, in the outworking of his sovereignty in the world. And so when we're praying, and we're not always going to get it right, of course we're not. <clears throat> and we grow up with habits, uh, yeah? Um, but it's so important that we recognise these foundations when we pray. Um, and, you know, we get frustrated sometimes because when we pray, we don't seem to get an answer. Um, we've said in the name of Jesus, but we've got no authority to actually ask for what we're asking for. And we've not actually found what's his heart and mind on this matter. Yeah, I think a lot of the times we pray, we get the answer no, but we don't, we just don't like it. <coughs> exactly we, so, Yeah, we don't like the answer. Um, it took me a while to realise that prayer and reading the Bible is for our benefit. You know, God doesn't need us to read his word. He doesn't no, he need doesn't. us to pray. <clears throat> but yeah, like now I'm reading the Bible a lot more. I've read, like it's, it's for my benefit to know his word. Um, he doesn't need me to know his word, but it helps me a lot. Absolutely. He's so, given it to us to assist us. Yeah. It's not to assist him. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's for us to get to know his mind and for us to know his heart and to align our lives and how we outwork them and to allow and to align our thinking and our motivations to coincide with what he has declared in his word, the Bible. Yeah. So question number two, mm -hmm. is prayer just about asking for things? <clears throat> In a sense, prayer is transactional. You know, I can ask you to make me a cup of coffee and you can say yes or no to that. Um, but I have made a request to you who can make the coffee and have got the coffee, you know, the grains or whatever, and you can provide them for me. You know, there's an old grammatical term. Um, and I heard it this morning just in Nero, somebody was in the queue and um, saying to the lady behind the counter, can I have, and I don't know what it was she was asking, but she said, can I have? And the person behind the counter said, yes, you can, and got her. Whereas grammatically it is, may I have? Of course she can have what was behind the counter, but whether she is going to get it or not, is another topic altogether. And sometimes, you know, we, um, when we're praying and asking for things, we say, can I have this, Father God? And, you know, grammatically, yes, you can have it. But may you have it? Wow, that's another thing altogether. And so prayer is transactional in a sense, where we give our request to God and he gives us the answers. But associated with that is worship. That's 
aligning with prayer and conversation, thanksgiving, aligning ourselves with God's will. Jesus modelled it for us. In Matthew 6, again, one of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, and in Matthew 6, it begins, Our Father which is in heaven, hallowed be your name. So what do we see there? It's, we see there that before a request is being made, the transactional aspect of our conversation with God, there is an acknowledgement of who God is and reverence to his name. When we acknowledge who he is and we are showing reverence to his name, that then brings all our transactional requests into another sphere of our thinking altogether. In the scripture in Matthew 6, verse 9 to 13, I'm not going to read it all, but it says, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. This is what Jesus said to us as a template for prayer. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So the heart and mind of God in heaven, when we are praying, we're saying, as Jesus taught us, your will be done. So when we're doing our transactional praying and we're saying, can I, can I, can I, in Christ, we can have all things. But may we have completely different thing altogether. Yeah. So. Father could say to us, yeah, you can have that, but I ain't going to give it to you. Yeah, so, so if we, you know, because our idea we try to align our will with God's. Um, and exactly. We, we all fall short of that, obviously, because we, you know, we have our own ideas. Yeah, what absolutely. We, what, we, what we think we want. Our own aspirations and desires drive us. So if we, if we in a hypothetical situation, perfectly aligned our will with God, we could have anything, anything we wanted. Because of, because our will would be in line with God's will, and if you ask for something and it's it's aligned with God's will, He'll give it to you. Yeah. But you know we don't we have our own ideas. I can talk about my own examples of you know my ideas I've had. Give me an example. Well, when I first started my business, I was like, um, you know. Uh, what do you do? So I started a recruitment agency okay. at the start okay. of this year. And I had this idea, I'm going to make loads of money, I'm going to make like millions of pounds and I'm going to use it to do God's will. Um, you know, there might have been some part of me subconsciously, I was like, oh, if I get this money to do God's will, I have the money. Um, but, you know, um, yeah, it's not, you know, I'm putting my will into that as well when it's, you know, God's got different plans. Um, so, yeah. Um, Can I just say there that sometimes... And we have to find out um, and that's discerning the will of God um, and we get to understand that a bit more in prayer <clears throat> but sometimes the aspirations that we have and our desires are born out of God but we need to really find out if our desires and aspirations are born out of being birthed by God in our hearts and minds yeah okay so the next question, if God's will is already determined, does prayer change anything? While it's true that God's will is sovereign, um, and you know, that there is nothing that can change the will of God. We could pray, to use a, a phrase, we can pray till we're blue in the face. Um, we can pray like Jesus, Till we sweat drops of blood. But that will not change the sovereign will of God. Yeah. Um, however, because we are co-workers together with God, um, he calls upon us to pray. Uh, not because he needs us to, but he wants us to have the joy of being engaged in the outworking of his sovereign will and purposes and plans. So, you know, like Jesus, when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he sweat great drops of blood, the Bible tells us. Yeah, so he was praying out of the anguish of his heart, saying, can I, can I, can I? As I was explaining early. Uh, um, but he recognised 
the difference between can I and may I? And he, when he realised the may I, is when he said, but nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Mm. You see the difference between can I and may I? And so the question, does prayer change anything? Yeah. <clears throat> For us, it changes things. Yeah, our perception, what we see occurring, <coughs> we look at prayer and we say, yeah, I prayed and that changed something. But in actual fact, the prayer that we are praying, no matter how earnest it might be, in reality isn't changing anything. It's just allowing us to work as co-laborers together with the outworking of what God has already decided to do. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, you see scripture affirms that prayer is powerful and it is. It affirms that prayer is effective, but that doesn't mean that we change God's mind. It doesn't mean we change God's will and it doesn't mean we change God's purposes. Rather, God works through our prayers to bring about his will. Not that our prayers are the catalyst that allows his will to be performed. It isn't because he will do it because he's sovereign. Because any time that his will is dependent upon us means that suddenly sovereign God is no longer sovereign. Yeah. And we have become sovereign because his will is determined by us. That will never, ever... Am I making sense? Yeah. That will I, never, ever happen. What that reminds me of is, you know, I've been reading through the Old Testament again, and <clears> what I notice is, is that God uses... He uses people to perform his will. So, you know, he used people to um, invade other tribes and, and kill off people. Um, and those people, they thought they are doing their own will. They're like, yes, we invade this tribe. But then God punishes them later... For their own evil acts yeah um so you know even when people think they're performing their, their own will actually they're performing the will of god mm. which is you know i I, I often like to think of god as the ultimate chess player because yeah. <laughs> he, he's, he, he's always going to check me yeah. <laughs> we think we're doing we're, we're, like, yes, we're, we're doing our own thing yeah we're, 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 we're creating our own lives yeah. right? we're, we're moving there. our own pieces around yeah yeah which is, is quite funny <clears> one, one thing uh, important thing is you see that I wrote in some of my notes here that prayer invites God to act in our lives and in the world. But in fact, when I think about it, it's the reverse of that. That prayer is God's method of inviting us to act in our lives and in our world. Yeah. Because there is a complete difference between those two things. One is allowing him to do something, exercising our sovereignty, the other way is God acting in his sovereignty and allowing us to participate in what he's doing. We can't fully comprehend how prayer works. You know, <clears throat> for instance, somebody might say, oh, well, I know something that contradicts what you said, Albert. You know, in Exodus 32, it, pray, it, it, it says there that God was angry, yeah, towards Israel because they had, you know, gone off the tracks. And Moses prayed for God to relent from his anger towards Israel, and God did. We're told about that in this Old Testament book called Exodus, verse 30, chapter 32 and verse 14. That didn't mean that God's nature changed, but rather he engages with us in a relationship where prayer matters. Yeah, I've got, that, that's how you think of a very interesting point in the Bible. Um, when... <coughs> When Abraham says to God, he's standing, um, I can't, I'm, I'm going to butcher it, I can't remember the, the, where exactly he was, but Abraham's overlooking a city and, and God's going to punt, like, destroy the city. Oh, yeah. And God's, Will you save them for 50, yeah. 40, 30, 20, 10? Yeah. yeah. So, just for the people watching, so Abraham, um, so God's about to destroy a city and Abraham says, <coughs> well, if there's 50 righteous people in that city, we destroy And God goes, no. He says, okay, what about 40? What about 30? And God says, no. And God spares the city. Um, you know, God's not like, oh, you know, Abraham, you're right. Okay, I won't. Like, he already knew in advance of course what was going to happen, but he yeah. allowed Abraham to challenge him. He knows the beginning, the middle, 
and the end. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I thought it was very interesting that he allowed Abraham to challenge him that way. Yeah. And then listen to him. So what? 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 A question to ask you then. What do you think God allowing Abraham to challenge God did for Abraham? It allowed him to see that God was righteous. Mm -hmm. um, but for Abraham, that's just a perception of who God was. What did it do for Abraham? Let me answer the question. Yeah, go on. Okay. Here all day. <clears throat> what it did for Abraham was it allowed him to engage in intimacy with God Almighty himself. It allowed him to engage with God Almighty and what God Almighty was doing on a basis of I can talk to you rationally, I can talk to you uh, from where I'm coming from and you're not going to just slap me down. You're allowing me to engage with you even though you are God. So it was an intimacy that he discovered with God that potentially he didn't have before. Because, you know, <clears throat> we just read that story about Abraham and we, we, we say that. And, and we don't think about, well, when Abraham saw that there were 50 and he wanted to pose the question about 40, you know, did he, with reticence, say, well, God, you know, if there's, if there's 40, will you do something? OK, I won't. OK, um, can I push this a bit <laughs> further? OK, if there's 30, will you relent from destroying? Um, OK, Abraham, I won't. OK, OK. Oh dear, you know, and even I'm thinking about it now, and I'm, I'm the hairs on the back of my neck are start, starting to stand up as I'm trying to put myself in Abraham's position. And he's going further, he's pushing, and he's pushing the envelope, and he's pushing the envelope. Well, you know, if there's ten, will you relent? Okay, Abraham, I won't destroy the city if there's ten. And I think by that time. Abraham had thought, right, I ain't going to push this any further. You know, I've gone this level, this level, this level, this level. But it showed to him what a phenomenal intimacy he could have with God Almighty, whose face he couldn't even see without dying. Yeah. You know, if he had looked upon God, the Bible says he would have died. And yet in light of that, he had the gall and the challenging of God Almighty himself, stage by stage by stage, pushing the envelope, pushing the envelope, until he got to number 10, and he thought, I better not push this any further. So that's what Abraham learned, plus many other things, I'm sure. But that's one of the things that he learned fundamentally yeah. From that experience, that, that's a very yeah, that's a very powerful part of the Bible, and it's you know if you just read that on a superficial level, you're like, oh, look, Abraham was only God. God doesn't know what he's doing. Well, oh. yes, you could look at it like that, yeah. yeah. And I'm making God by the power of my intellect and emotion. Um, I'm changing God's mind. Yeah, which I think God, God obviously knew in advance Abraham wasn't going to take it that way. So yeah, that's of course. Why, otherwise, he, I'm, I'm sure he wouldn't let someone for the pride challenge him. Yeah, so God had already decided for 10. Yeah. But he allowed Abraham to engage through prayer, his conversation with God, in his purposes and his plans. So at the end of it, Abraham could walk away thinking, yeah, I prayed and you know, the persistent prayer of, of a righteous man avails a lot, the Bible says. And I pray powerfully with God. You know, I push the envelope with God and look what's been accomplished. And you also learn that God is righteous. Um, yeah. You know, he, yeah, he's, he, I think he was also challenging God to open like, okay, God, can I trust you? Are you actually righteous? Are you holy? And he learned that through that conversation. Yeah. Um, Okay, so yeah, the next question, mm -hmm. number four, are we trying to get God to do what we want <coughs> through prayer? Uh, yeah, well, um, true prayer isn't trying to get God to do our will. That's not what true prayer is. Um, if you're having a conversation with Amy, okay, 
let's change the word conversation to prayer. You're praying to Amy, yeah? And you're saying you want steak and chips for your dinner, yeah? And she had already prepared pizza. Um, she knows what you're gonna get, pizza, okay? But you are you saying- steak, steak and chips. Eh? Steak and chips. I'm already gonna get, she's already prepared steak and chips. Okay, I'm all right, put it that way. Yeah, she's already prepared steak and chips, yeah? And you've gone to her and you've said, I want steak and chips for my dinner, okay? And she'd already decided she's gonna make you steak and chips because it's your favorite, whatever, yeah. Um, and you are surrendered to what she had already decided to make it. Great, it was what you wanted anyway, yeah? Um, so we're gonna go back to the beginning when we say in Jesus' name, and you could be saying in Amy's name, yeah, I'm asking in Amy's name for steak and chips, yeah? Uh, if you'd already known that it was her heart and mind to give you steak and chips, you could very, with great validity say, in Amy's mind, in Amy's name, I want steak and chips and you get it. Yeah. Okay. Um, that's why it's so important to know what the heart and mind of God is um, when we say in Jesus' name. You know, Jesus, when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, he models this perfectly to us. And he said, not my will, but yours be done. Okay, and that's in uh, the Gospel of Luke 22 and verse 42. Um, and I, I mentioned earlier about Jesus saying, you know, if you take this cup from me, yet not my will, yours be done, when I explained about can I and may, yeah? Um, so are we trying to get God to do what we want through prayer? Yeah, on a superficial, superficial level, we are. Because when we start to engage in prayer, what comes to our mind? What we want. You know, we want a better job. Uh, we want, a, we want a, um, a better girlfriend, we want a better boyfriend, we want a better car, we want a better salary. <clears throat> All these natural things are what we want. And so when we come to prayer, what is foremost in our mind most of the time is what we want. Yeah. But what should be foremost in our mind all the time is what does he want. Okay. Now, he may want to give us all those things. Okay, what I'd say is, um, so it, it, there's nothing wrong with wanting a better job, wanting more nothing money. Nothing at all. You should want those things. Correct, you should um, aim for things, yeah. But under underlying it all, there should be, you know, you should put God first because you know that and that's for our benefit if we if we worship anything other than god it's to our own detriment you know? it doesn't doesn't necessarily hurt god um you're upset him obviously but you know he doesn't need us for anything no um so if we put god first in all in all that we do and then on top of that we pray for you know the better job the the better business the more money to avoid the crucifixion yeah um is god it's God wanting to give us all that if he knows that it's not going to take us away from him. But then if, if, if he knows that once we get those things, we're going to forget about him, um, then he's not going to give it to us. So if we align ourselves with God, I'm up, and this is a genuine question, um, if we set our hearts on God first and foremost and keep it that way and then pray for these other things, is he more likely to give it to us? You mean, have we persuaded him by doing something good? No, 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 no. Like if so, if we, if our hearts are set on him, mm -hmm. and then we get these other things, he so he knows that our hearts aren't going to desire these other things more than we desire him. So he's more likely to give it to us. Whereas if he knew that if you know if you give something <coughs> to God, his faith is quite weak, and he just threw millions of pounds on them, they're likely to be like, oh, you know what, I've got this. I, I don't need God. I can manage on my own. Now. Yeah, yeah. Whereas if he knows your heart is set on him. Mm -hmm then, he, you know, he knows the money's not going to take you away from him. Yeah, there's a key verse found in the Gospels and it says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Fundamentally, the child of God's walk of faith is determined by that, seeking first the kingdom of God, i.e. everything that relates to the king of kings and the outworking of his kingdom, power and sovereignty. Seek first the kingdom of God 
and his righteousness being outworked in our lives. It then goes on to say, and all these things shall be added unto you. Now, all those things could be some of the things you've just mentioned, yeah? Or it could be totally different things that are added. But God knows the end from the beginning. He knows exactly what we need. He knows exactly what he gives to us, the outworking of having that thing in our lives. And he knows the good and the bad that might flow from those things that he has given to us. Now, there will be times we might think, well, it's a bit off that he should do that. <clears throat> He'll give us things that are detrimental to us. Um, he isn't being malicious. He isn't being evil toward us. But occasionally he will give us things that he knows are going to be detrimental. But those detrimental things, recognising he knows the end from the beginning, yeah, those detrimental things, as they are outworked in our journey of faith, are going to have a contribution to how we are changed into the likeness of his son. Let me give you an example of what I mean. In Christian circles, there are phrases that are thrown around as a panacea to people who are going through difficult times. Yeah. One of the most favourite phrases <clears throat> when somebody's going through a hard time is, oh, don't worry, don't worry. God works all things together for good to them that love God and are called according to his purpose. And that's a lovely verse. You know, and you listen to that in the midst of your trial and tribulation, think, oh, yeah, okay. God, you're working all things together for my good, you know, and great. You know, I needed that and I'm going to get it. That's the natural conclusion of that. I want that and I'm going to have it. You're going to change this situation completely around. What's dark become is going to become light and what's raining is going to become sunshine. Everything's going to be changed round like a Disney world to a fantasia of glorious and wonderful experience because all things are going to work together for good because I love God and I'm called to work according to his purpose. But what they forget is the next verse is what denotes and explains what the good is that's talked about when it says all things work together for good because in the next verse it explains that the good being achieved through what we're going through is the transformation of us into the likeness of his son. Now that doesn't mean that our circumstances are going to change. It doesn't mean everything's suddenly going to become great and wonderful. We might still have to go through the valley of the shadow of death, as the psalmist puts it. But the result from it is that we are more beautified in the character of Christ. Yeah. And so sometimes he will give us the desires of our heart. There is a verse of scripture that says that God gives us the desires of our heart that sent leanness into our soul. So sometimes he gives us the desires of our heart, but he knows that we're going to get lean in our soul. But he knows the end from the beginning and he knows we're going to learn through it. Yeah. Because it's a bit of a long winded way to answer yeah, the question. Yeah, I, know, cause I hope you understand what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Money always has this <clears throat> yeah. evil, like this um sort of like stigma around it. But yeah. in the Bible, money's is seen as a good thing, like Job had it. Um a lot of the uh Money is an evil. Yeah, it's, it's the it's, love of it. It's it's a tool. Yeah. Um, you know, and yeah, for example, like Job, um he was rewarded for his uh, righteousness with with yeah. wealth, yeah. so it's, it's not it's not a bad thing. And a pro, the pro, uh, proverbs talk a lot about money being a positive thing. Mm -hmm. um, but as you said, it, it depends. You know, if you end up worshiping it, correct. Because if you love it more than you love God, you yeah. might find you ain't got it long. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, and that, that would be a good thing. Um, if you know, if you're worshiping money, God takes it away from you. That's him being kind to you. Yeah, it is um, him being kind. Because yeah. if he just let you know, you wouldn't like, see it as that. But yeah, yeah, yeah. You're yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. Um, but you know, you know, if you see somebody who's really rich and they're worshiping money, 
and they've worked for the rest of their lives, well, they're, they're, you know, they don't have their soul. Mm. Um, yeah, so it's, it, it, money is just a tool. It depends how you use it, like anything. <coughs> um, so there's not, it's nothing wrong with wanting, wanting to be rich. Like you should, because, yeah. when, you know, if you've got a heart aligned with, with God <coughs> and you genuinely want to help other people, the more money you've got, the more you can do that. Mm. You know, if Absolutely you, um, right. if you've got loads of friends and f- family who are suffering financially, and you don't have any money, mm. you can't really help that much. But mm. if you've got the money, you can help. Yeah. So if you've not... got people out there in the world who need Christ, um, you know, if you've got money, how much more effective can you be in your mission activities of you know building churches and you know planting wells in villages, um, which all smack of the love of God, and then draw people to Christ. Yeah, the danger is because money gives you self-sufficiency. Correct. Which is so easy to then start being like, do you know what? I've, you know, I've got, I've got a million pounds in the bank. I don't really need God. Yeah. I've, I've got Your pride God. says, I'm okay, mate. Yeah. Yeah. But the, you know, we, we all know, we, we all know this, but I don't think anyone, like, lots of people don't believe it, but, you know, you, you get these, like, rich uh, children or, like, uh, trust fund kids. Yeah. They've always got a hole in their heart and they end up on drugs, they end up killing themselves. Yeah, yeah. Which is, it should show us that having the fame and having the money doesn't lead you to yeah. fulfilment. You just look, at, just look at, you know, the examples that come on the news of people who've won the lottery. Happy for a year, miserable for the rest of their lives. Correct, yeah. Yeah, which... they've got everything they wanted or thought they needed and wanted, all in a massive pile there for them, and they've lived it up for a while, and then they're miserable thereafter. I think I heard Mike Tyson say this, but he said, you know, sometimes God punishes you by giving you everything you thought you wanted, mm. because you know, if you think, oh, you know, once I get rich, once I get famous, once I get successful into God, then I'll be happy, and you get it all, and you still, you're still miserable. Yeah, you think. What is there? Yeah, yeah. Which, you know, and that, that hole in your heart only God can feel. Yeah. Um, and a missing ear. <laughs> all right. You're For about, Tyson. All oh, right, okay. I thought you were talking about when uh, <coughs> the Pharisee got his yeah. ear chopped off. No, no. Um, okay, so question five. Uh-huh. What if it feels like God isn't answering? Okay. Let me first say that God's silence is not absence. Mic drop. Yeah, uh, exactly, mic drop. God's silence is not absence. When it seems um, that God isn't answering when you're praying and the ceiling feels like it's concrete, it, you know, it's a glass ceiling and you, you're praying and it just feels like you're just not even getting it above the atmosphere in which you find yourself, it's tempting to think that he's distant or unconcerned about you. And the enemy loves that. He loves to, at those moments, to whisper in you, yeah, yeah, God's not interested in you. Why should he be interested in you? You can't even pray very well. You know, you jabber on and you talk about stuff and you're filled with your own thoughts and mind when you're chatting to Father. You know, um, why on earth should he listen to you? And that's what he likes to whisper. But he is listening and he's not absent. You see, God is working in ways, invariably, that we can't see, and he's using the waiting period in which we are struggling, in which we are trying to discover how we get above that ceiling, and how we discover to um, come against the, the whispers of the devil, as a waiting period for us to grow in faith. An example, Um, I run from my local church, a local life group. Uh, There aren't many in the life group, but we meet every two weeks on a Friday evening in the coffee bar at the church. And we're dealing with a topic at at the moment about faith and doubt and overcoming the lies of the enemy by our faith. And when we go through a difficult time, The enemy loves to come along and he'll say, you're not good enough. That's why he's not answering your prayer. And we then feel like, well, we've got to work harder. Um, You're not worthy enough. And so we start like the old 
Roman Catholic priests of old who, you know, used to whip themselves, mm -hmm. you know, and lacerate their backs because they weren't worthy enough and they thought by doing that they'd become more worthy. Um, and the enemy loves at times when we feel like God is not answering to start doing all that us, at us. But those waiting periods are designed to grow our faith. In 2 Corinthians 12 verse 9, now 2 Corinthians 12 verse 9, Corinthians is a book, a letter in fact, wrote, wrote to a group of Christians in Corinth. And the guy who wrote it was a guy called Paul. <clears throat> and Paul wrote in his second letter to this Corinthian set of believers in the 12th chapter, it was a very long letter, in the 12th chapter and the 9th verse, he said, my grace is sufficient for you and my power is made perfect in weakness. Now, what did that relate to? He had what was termed a thorn in the flesh. Now, a lot of people have got ideas about what this thorn in the flesh was, this problem he was facing all the time. And it says, and Paul was, a, you know, a prayer. You know, he used to pray a lot. And he had a brilliant relationship with God, very intimate relationship with God. And he came to God and he prayed three times, will you take this problem away from me? Please take this problem away from me. Didn't get an answer. So he prayed again, maybe at the same time or maybe later on, as the problem got worse. Will you take this problem away from me, this thorn in the flesh? Didn't get an answer. Third time he does it, maybe more earnestly this time, because he felt that God hadn't answered him on the previous two occasions. And then God said to him, Paul, my grace, my loving kindness, my goodness, my companionship is sufficient for you. And not only that, Paul, you are going to do glorious and wonderful things for me and through me. And my power is going to be made manifest to the world and why is it going to be looking so much greater? Because it's perfected through your weakness. And so what he saw as God not answering him was really God perfecting his own power through him in this particular scenario and showing that God's grace will always be sufficient for what we're going through. In Psalm 27 and verse 14, it encourages us, says, it says there, wait for the Lord. So that's when we're waiting. We feel that God isn't answering. It's encouraging us to hang on, wait around, be patient, be calm, and be strong and take heart, it goes on to say. Because we know that God's silence is not absence. We know that God will always come back to us. It might take, as it was in the case of Abraham, many, many, many years. Because God, you know, we remember Abraham, he waited 25 years. So, you know, silence was not absence. God was working with Abraham all the time over this 25 years to fulfill his promise of giving him a son. You know, they were both antiques, him and, Mary, him and Sarah, both antiques passed biologically ever having a child but it was so important in those days to have a child and God said yeah you're going to years went by first year went by second year went by third year went by fifth year went by tenth year 20th year 25th year comes and still Sarah's not pregnant he continued to believe Sarah you know tripped up a bit you know and, and laughed at God's promise um, but it says in the book of Romans, and again, this is another letter written by Paul to the Roman church of the day in the fourth chapter. It says that Abraham did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God. So he saw God at work, but the thing that he was really wanting took a long time, but God came through in the end and God will always, always, always come through in the end. 
So God's silence should not make us think that he is absent when we are seeking after him. During that silence, we just need to get on and do what he's put into our hands to do and allow him to do what he wants to do when he wants to do it and in the way that he wants to do it. Amen. Is patient and trust really that important in prayer? I think they're fundamental, uh, absolutely fundamental aspects of vibrant prayer life because God's ways and timings are beyond our understanding. You know, we just got to accept that. His ways are higher than our ways and his thoughts are beyond our thoughts. Um, he gives us a glimpse of them from time to time and we understand, you know, a fraction of something about him and, you know, we're blown away <clears throat> by that little crack of light that suddenly appeared. We're blown away by it. And yet there's, there's a massive lighthouse behind that that we haven't even begun to delve into. And so patience and trust is a fundamental aspect. Prayer isn't, you see, just about the act of asking. It's about learning to rely on God's perfect wisdom and his timing. Sometimes the answer comes quickly, but more often God's answers are delayed for reasons that are beneficial to our spiritual growth. It's not he's held up. It's not that he's too busy. It's not that his agenda suddenly got filled with a load of angels coming to him in heaven saying, oh, we've got to do this, we've got to do that, we've got to do that. Oh, oh OK, let me put Brandon and Albert aside for a moment. I'd better deal with this first. You know, God didn't get caught up in that. Um, you know, he handles everything all at once, you know. Um, but sometimes how he comes to us is slower. And we don't like it because we're impatient, you know. We want him to answer. Um, and we think, oh, well... You know, I'm being patient here, but, you know, my patience is coming to an end here a bit. You know, and can I trust God to do this? Well, he hasn't done it in this time frame. I don't think he's going to. Um, but it's beneficial for our spiritual growth. You know, if, if you had a child and every time the child came to you and asked for something, you gave it to them immediately, they'd soon become a very spoiled child. And you do see that. Even in Christian families, you see spoiled kids you know, being given everything they ask for, whenever they ask for it, and all the time. Just, yeah, just <coughs> on, on that note, there was someone who I, I follow online, and he, 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 he came up with a really interesting strategy. He said he's a father to, to a son, and he said he's got the, uh, the 7 out of 10 rule. He'll, anything his son asks for, within the reason, like obviously, if it's something sensible, he'll give it to him 7 out of 10 times. Mm -hmm. So 3 out of 10 times, for no reason, he'll say no. Mm. There's no, there's no reason. I thought that was so interesting. <coughs> but yes, it's like you said, you just give them everything. They, they become entitled and they expect it. But yeah. if three out of ten times, you just say no. And, and you use that word entitled there. We live in a day and generation. You know, I'm not having a go at young people and millennials, millennials and Gen Z. You know, and you know the thirty year olds up to maybe fifties. I'm not, you know, I'm just not having a go at them. But they are so um, entitled. Yeah, it's, 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 it's an entitlement attitude. It's the environment. Um, yes, yeah, the, the environment. Because we're all like, yeah. for example, if 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 the role, roles were reversed and your generation grew up, my generation, and vice versa, it'd still be the same. It would. So it's it's the environment, and it's because things have become so easy, um, and we don't feel like we need we we need got our oh, we, look we work for money we don't need yeah, God. exactly. Um, and yeah, you just get everything you're, you're given. And and they see people with stuff that they worked all their lives for and they haven't got it. And because they're living in the type of world we're living, they feel, I'm entitled to do that. But entitlement comes about by what you've done before. Yeah. If you ain't done anything before, you're not entitled. It's probably, it's probably one of the most ugly traits I've seen in people. Oh, yeah. Entitlement. Yeah, yeah. And it's pride. Pride says, I'm entitled to this because of who I am. Well, who you are is nothing. <laughs> Absolutely nothing in the sight of God. You're not entitled to anything. Made in fact, dirt. you've got everything you're entitled to. You're dying in your sin. Yeah. But God, even in the midst of that proudful entitlement, says, however, but God in his mercy gave Jesus. 
and in his grace he says, come unto me. Um, and you know, with thinking about waiting and trust and so on, it, it's character building. You know, we need our characters. And we could talk about Joseph and how long he had to wait before he became second to Pharaoh in Egypt. But he had to wait a long time and to go through a lot of difficulties. And his faith never wavered. Um, no. Because, so after God promised that his, his brothers would end up like, bound to him, um, after that happened, he was sold to the, to the yeah. sold as a slave. Yeah. And he ended up in prison. Yeah. So after being promised this, this beautiful thing, he gets thrown yeah. to the bottom into a prison, absolutely. into a prison cell. Um, and even when he is in the prison cell, um, his faith is still strong. Yeah, absolutely. And, and God was still with him. Yeah. You know, uh, God was still with him. And, you know, if it wasn't for the butler, if it wasn't for the bread maker, if it wasn't for his coat of many colours, mm. if it wasn't for this, if it wasn't for that, if it wasn't that the slave traders came along, if it wasn't that his brothers put him in a pit, if it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't. You know, we look at it, if, if it wasn't, and, and then we suddenly think, and yet God elevated him to this position. So can we say, if, 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 if it wasn't? God had planned it all right down to his coat that he would that would start off the process of being elevated to the second only to um pharaoh yeah and everything that happened afterwards joseph, if it wasn't yeah. for that coat joseph he he was a really beautiful person <clears throat> in the bible in terms of like when he you know his brothers betrayed him yeah. they sold him into slavery uh they were trying to get him killed basically um without having any blood in their own hands and even when he, you know, the, the, the tables were turned and he had all the power and he, he could have just killed his brothers, he didn't. Um, and he was weeping for them. He, yeah. You know, he'd go into another room and then start weeping. He was a, yeah, he, he, was, he had a lot of grace. Yeah, of course he did. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And he learnt it. He learnt it through what he suffered. And we don't like suffering. No, that's no, you, and you shouldn't like suffering. <coughs> no, absolutely. It becomes a bit if you yeah, if, if you yeah. enjoy suffering, that's a bit yeah, yeah, that's a bit yeah, a bit weird. <laughs> yes, it's a bit weird. Absolutely, yeah. Right. So um, yeah, so we're about at the end. Or yeah. have you got another question? No, I think we can we can leave it there. Shall I conclude today? Or? Of course. <clears throat> okay. So we're talking about prayer, and we've been talking about prayer and what prayer was, and I think ultimately, prayer is about us partnering with God in his work. Prayer is about building a deeper relationship with him. Prayer is aligning our hearts and our minds to his will. Absolutely true, God does not need us to pray, but he desires that we experience the joy and the privilege of participating in his purposes and the outworking of his sovereign will. Whether we're asking for um, daily needs, worshipping him in his greatness, or waiting in silence, every prayer, it draws us closer to God. And as we grow in what we call prayer, in our conversational attitude with him, we learn that it's not about changing God's mind because we can't do that because then we become God, but about transforming our hearts and our lives to reflect his mind and his will. Martin Luther said something of, of profound implication. And I'll read what he says, very short, <clears throat> and you might need to listen to it a few times to actually get a grip of it. But he said, God wants us to pray and he wants to hear our prayers, not because we are worthy, but because he is merciful. Let me read that again to you, Brandon, and, and to those that are engaging the podcast. God wants us to pray. And he wants to hear our prayers, not because we are worthy, but because he is merciful toward us. Amen. Amen.